Evan Barak's offer in June 2000 at Camp David um, was probably not an offer that one could legitimately ask Arafat to say yes to, since Barak wanted essentially to annex 9% of the West Bank uh, and then only trade 1% of Israel's land inside the Green Line in return, and Barack also wanted to keep the Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley for 12 years. I think that was, is that Shlomo ben Ami himself, the Israeli foreign minister, has said, if I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected that offer. But the Clinton parameters, which were six months later, in December 2000, were a much more generous, and I think uh, much closer to what I think the Palestinians reasonably should have been able to expect. And Arafat's offer was, evasive, as typical, what Arafat. He basically said, I accept in principle the parameters, but then he gave a whole series of conditions that really rendered meaningless his acceptance. It's also worth, but one should also acknowledge that the Israeli response to the Clinton parameters is also to say, we accept it in principle. We, the Clinton parameters said, basically, Israel, the, the Palestinian state will be on 95 to 99 percent of the West Bank. But then the Israelis said, we accept it, but we still need to control 8 percent of the West Bank. So the Israelis and the, the Clinton parameters said an international force in the Jordan Valley, and the Israelis said we accept it, but we still need Israeli troops in the Jordan Valley. So the Israelis did some version of that themselves. I think Arafat, um, I don't think Arafat launched the second intifada that began in 2000. I think it was launched by a younger cadre of people from his own Fatah party, but he essentially acquiesced. He didn't make an effort to stop it. He essentially believed that a little bit of violence maybe could help his negotiating position. And I call in my book that that decision of his not just a mistake, but a crime. Um, so I, I think I am pretty critical of the Palestinians, but I also think that the, con the conventional narrative, which is that Israel essentially has repeatedly offered the Palestinians everything, and the Palestinians have said no, really misunderstands some of the fundamental dynamics in these negotiations. The truth of the matter is that Israel almost always, Israel always asks to annex 8, 7, or at least 6% of the West Bank. Now, why do they want to do that? Because if you look at where the large settlements are, they need to annex that much land in order to keep very, some of the very large settlements. The problem with that is there are settlements like Ariel, which Israel absolutely demands that it's going to keep, which really do imperil the contiguity of a Palestinian state. Ariel stretches 13 miles into the West Bank. So if you look at a map of the West Bank, you see that the northern Palestinian cities of Kalkilia and Tolkarim are right on the Green Line. And then you have essentially Ariel, like this, stretching thir jutting 13 miles into the West Bank and making access from those Palestinian cities into the rest of the West Bank very, very difficult. And this is why I think it's simply not accurate to say that the settlements don't pose a real obstacle to these negotiations. The Palestinians have made offers. As far as we can tell on the table today, the Palestinians have an offer of a 1.9% equal land swap. The reason, the, Pal the reason it's so difficult for Israel to accept a 1.9% land swap is it would simply require Israel to have to dismantle settlements that Israel has never thought it was going to have to dismantle, and frankly, settlements that a lot of Israelis just don't think it has the capacity to dismantle. Ehud Barak wanted to annex 80% of the settlers because he took power right very soon after Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. And we know from his own advisors that he was very concerned that unless he could annex 80% of the settlers, that there might be civil war. But if you annex that many settlers, you create real contiguity problems for a Palestinian state. So that's why I think, though there have been very serious Palestinian failures, um, that, the, um, that the failures are on both sides, and that the settlement project makes the gap between the two sides wider and wider. I think it would be helpful if you would just say, really briefly, what you think Netanyahu's map is. Because he has said he, he he believes in a two-state solution. So yes. what is his vision? Because in your book, yes. it seems like yes. every time uh, there is a blueprint, yes. he pulls back from it. What well, I think this is really, I think you put your finger on something very important. Netanyahu has never presented any map, as far as we know, in the negotiations. It's important to remember the context. In, before he got elected, in late 2008, there were these marathon negotiations between Ehud Omer and Mahmoud Abbas. Omer reportedly wanted to annex 6.3% of the West Bank and give 5.7% back. The Palestinians reportedly had an offer which was about this 1.9% or 2% land swap. 
Those were the negotiations that were taking place basically up until Ahmed Omar had to step down because of corruption allegations. When Netanyahu came into power, the Obama administration wanted him to continue those negotiations of Omer. He refused to continue those negotiations. Remember, when Netanyahu came into power in early 2009, he was still on record as opposing a Palestinian state, period. If the vision is not 67 lines plus land swaps, it's very hard to understand what his vision of a Palestinian state would be, since all of the serious negotiations have basically been about 67 lines plus land swaps. Uh, there have been actually been a number of cabinet ministers from Netanyahu's own government, uh, uh, Moshe Bugiyai alone, who's the, who's the vice prime minister, said late last year that this government is opposed to the two-state solution. Uh, Benny Begin, who's one of the in, in, inner cabinet ministers, said this government's position is opposed to a two-state solution. And I think um, until Benjamin Netanyahu says that he not only supports a Palestinian state, but that he supports a Palestinian state within the same framework that Barack and Omer were negotiating, um, which is 67 lines plus swaps, it's hard to be able to say how serious he really is. And I think that's one of the problems we have. That's not to say that we know that Palestinians will ultimately make the very difficult decisions they will need to make. We don't know that. It may be that the Palestinian leadership ultimately can't do it, that it's too weak, that it's too corrupt, that it won't make the tough choices. But I think we have an Israeli government today that, unlike its predecessor, is not even really putting on the table a reasonable vision of what a Palestinian state would be. One of the things that, said, that uh, Netanyahu, I've heard him say, and, and someone touches on it here, is give me a credible peace partner yeah. and we will sit down. Yeah. If it was a Sadat, if there was a King Hussein of Jordan, but there isn't. So how do you respond to the idea that that person isn't there yet? Someone you can trust, someone who is really, genuinely wants a peace. Well, look, um, in Mahmoud Abbas, um, uh, you have someone who um, uh, his, uh, uh, explicitly says that he supports the Palestinian state near the 1967 lines, who according to quite a bit of reporting has an offer of a 1.9% land swap. And the, the testimony from Ehud Olman, who's Netanyahu's predecessor, is that Abbas was negotiating in good faith in late 2008, and Omer has said, we were fairly close to a deal, and he has urged Netanyahu to continue that. In fact, Ehud Omer wrote an op-ed in the New York Times last year in which he basically said, make a deal with this Palestinian leadership because you're not gonna get a Palestinian leadership that's good in the future. Remember, the reason that terrorism has declined so dramatically uh, from the West Bank. There is, unfortunately, still rocket fire from Gaza. But the reason there's been so few terrible terrorist attacks in Israel in recent years is partly because Israel built this security barrier, this separation barrier. But I've got news for you. It's not completely finished. There are huge gaps in that security barrier. The other big reason that, that violence is so down is that the Palestinians are doing, in the West Bank, are doing very good security cooperation with the government of Israel, as Israel's own military officials have said. So, now people will say Abbas is a weak leader. Yes, Abbas is a weak leader. He doesn't have a huge amount of credibility in his own society, partly because he doesn't have the revolutionary credentials that Arafat did, and partly because he doesn't have democratic legitimacy, because basically nobody wants to hold an election in the West Bank, neither Israel, nor America, nor the Palestinians, because they're afraid Hamas might win. But the question is, if you have a weak leader who has shown a genuine commitment to, to combating terrorism and an openness to a two-state solution. Maybe the smart political strategy is to try to do things to empower him, rather than doing what Israel has been doing, which is making him weaker and weaker and weaker by showing that his strategy of nonviolence and security cooperation is unable to stop the settlement growth that's eating away at the Palestinian state that he wants to create. And I'm sure you've heard many times, and some have asked it here as well, look at what happened in Gaza. That is not exactly uh, a beacon of, of uh, optimism for, the, for a West Bank withdrawal. Yes, yes. What's your response? Um, the first thing that I think it's important to remember about Gaza is that although Israel did dismantle its settlements in Gaza under al Sharon, Israel still remains the occupying power in Gaza. And you do, should, not, should not take that from me. That is the position, in fact, of the United States government. The United States government considers Israel to be the occupying power in Gaza. Now, how could Israel be the occupying power if it dismantled all its settlements? Well, imagine if 
we, because Israel controls access to Gaza by air, land, and sea, except for the crossing into Egypt at Rafah. So if the United States essentially controlled, had, had essentially a blockade of air access to Canada, and a blockade of naval access to Canada, and block of all land access to Canada except for one route, people would probably say that we were occupying Canada. Besides that, 30% of the of the arable land inside Gaza, because Gaza is a pretty small place, inside Gaza is off limits to Palestinians in Gaza because Israel has erect, erected a security perimeter inside the Gaza Strip. If Palestinians go into that area, they're liable to be, uh, to be shot at by Israeli soldiers across the line. So I think that's the first important thing to remember about Gaza. Um, God, what happened in Gaza was not the creation of a state. The second thing is that there was no peace deal in Gaza. Israel unilaterally, under Ali Sharon, decided it was going to dismantle its settlement. Um, if you want to look at precedents for a peace deal, the better precedents, it seems to me, are actually the peace deals that Israel has signed. There was no peace deal with the Palestinians. About the Palestinians never would have signed a peace deal in which basically they were simply given Gaza under those conditions. They signed the Oslo Accords. They never signed any agreement about Gaza. The two peace deals have been the deals with Jordan and Egypt. Now, we don't know what the future will hold in Jordan and Egypt. But for a very, quite a long time now, a space of decades, those peace deals with Jordan and Egypt have held. I think they've served Israel very well, even though the Egyptian population is wildly hostile to Israel. And the population in Jordan, which is a majority Palestinian, doesn't like Israel very much at all. Uh, but the government of Egypt and Jordan, even today with the Muslim Brotherhood, have seen it as in their own interest to respect the deals that they have made because they got something for them. And I think that is, I don't want to suggest that a Palestinian state is without risk. You have to be a fool to suggest that creating a Palestinian state does not create risk. Of course it creates risk, creates risks. But the question is the balance of risks. When you know that the status quo will certainly end Israel's existence as a democratic Jewish state. It's a balance of risk. And I think given the record we have of Israel's past peace agreements, this is the better risk to take. And what do you say to many Jews who would say, I'll risk the democratic character for the safety of this tiny, vulnerable nation? I guess I would say that I don't think it will work. I think even if you don't care about Israel as a democracy, say that's pie in the sky, liberal, Upper West Side, Zabar stuff. <laughs> we live in a, we live in a, you know, the people who wrote Israel's Declaration of Independence were not at Zabar's at the time. Um, but um, even if you believe that that, um, let's say you believe that Israel is in too tough a neighborhood to have to worry about these democratic niceties. Even in hard-headed, pragmatic, practical terms, I don't actually think that Israel in the long term can survive as a non-democratic Jewish state. The reason is that I think Israel will more and more become a pariah in the world. It, the, the, for me as a Jew, Israel's existence as a Jewish state helps to legitimize Israel's existence. But in most of the world, what legitimizes Israel's existence is Israel's democratic character. That's the same thing that essentially gives legitimacy to any government in today's world, because democracy is the lingua franca of our times. So if Israel is a democratic Jewish state, I think Israel's supporters can make the case for Israel's existence in any forum around the world. It will still be a hardcore of people who hate Israel. But the case will be e relatively easy to make. If Israel becomes a country which basically, in which basically the, Israel's non-Jewish population basically loses even the small rights that they have inside the Green Line, and the occupation becomes permanent, and Palestinians decide, you know what, the two-state solution is dead. There will never be a Palestinian state. Let's march by the tens or hundreds of thousands and ask for Israeli citizenship and say, we want to live with you as brothers and sisters together. Give us citizenship and the right to vote. And Israel says no. That is a debate that Israel will lose around the world. And ultimately, I think it will. Israel, if Zionism cannot remain a democratic project, I think ultimately Zionism itself in the long term will fail. And the Palestinians will succeed in turning the entire area between the Mediterranean and Jordan into what would be in name a secular binational state. In reality, I think would largely be another Arab state in which a large percentage of the Jewish population would lead. So can you give your vision for peace? What's the Beinart blueprint 
without going into too many numbers and specifics. I mean, you know, the, 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 the specifics are not in some ways that hard to figure out. I mean, the Clinton parameters laid them out fairly well. Clinton said the Palestinian state must be between 95 and 99 percent of the West Bank. It must be a demilitarized state. Israel should have early, should have um, uh, some access to the telecommunication spectrum, to the airspace, should have war, early warning signals. There should be an international, it should be a transition to an international force in the Jordan Valley. There should be a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. On the Temple Mount, which was a very, very sensitive question, what the Muslims call the Haram al-Sharif, you have to come up with some very, very creative, difficult issues there, but people worked on it. And on the Palestinian refugees, basically, you're going to have a relatively small number of Palestinian refugees, mostly older people who really were born in what's now Israel, and then the rest of the people will get some very large-scale compensation, the, the possibility of moving to a Palestinian state, and there will be some recognition of Palestinian suffering, which is really important to the Palestinians, but they often not recognized enough. But that, that, that the recognition by Israel and the world of what happened to the Palestinians in 1947 and 1948, when 750,000 Palestinians left their homes. You can debate about exactly why it happened, but it was a catastrophe for the Palestinians. It's really important for them. If you think about how important it is for Jews that the world recognizes the Holocaust, what happened to the Palestinians in 47 and 48 was not as bad as the Holocaust, I want to be clear, but it was their closest equivalent. And unless there is public recognition of what happened to the Palestinian people when Israel was created, that is absolutely crucial, it seems to me, for peace being able to take place. So those are the parameters. They're not controversial. The question is, are they still realistic, given that so many people have given up on the possibility of a two-state solution? And, the, and, and Israelis are upset that their Palestinians seem to be moving away from the two-state solution. That worries me a great deal as well. But a big part of the reason they're moving away from the two-state solution is they look at the dramatic growth in settlements, and they say, what Palestinian state are you talking about? This is a, this is a Palestinian state that is being more and more eaten away by uh, by Jewish settlement, we don't have the possibility of a viable Palestinian state anymore. Um, we're going to go to the microphone, Don tells me, which means that if I haven't asked your question and you want, definitely want to ask it, you can get up there, and I will also continue to work with the questions on the table and my own. Um, but I, yes, we want, you want to begin? Why don't you just say your name? My name is Pat Solomon, and I recently was in the occupied territories to understand the nature of occupation better and what was it exactly I was asking Israel to change. And I saw a much more subtle level uh, of victimization than voting or not voting. I saw people without water, without an ability to expand their homes if their family was growing, a lot of trouble around permit, uh, permitting, yeah. Yeah. and of course what you mentioned, yeah. is detention. Yeah. So could you speak a little bit about that subtle form of oppression that we're seeing that I think um, American Jews, if they saw it, would be as uncomfortable as I was? Yeah. Well, first of all, good for you for going. You know, I mean, I, I think um, if there's one, you know, besides the Jewish education piece, but I, the, the one thing that I, I think is most important for American Jews to hear, I think, is that when they go to Israel, they should really also take it upon themselves to have some experience with Palestinians who live in the West Bank. I mean, Gaza may be too difficult for them to go to, but, but to have an experience of what, to, to really experience Israel, it seems to me you have to experience all of the territory that Israel controls. And a large territory of that is the West Bank. Um, and I, that's not to say that you shouldn't have all the wonderful experiences that I had, that my children have, have had, going to the beach in Tel Aviv and going to the hotel and all those things, but you should also, it seems to me, if you don't really experience Palestinian life in the West Bank, I don't think you've really experienced Israel. Um, if you want to have an authentic relationship to Israel, you should actually experience that. And, and um, the, the problems that you're talking about, um, fundamentally, I think, flow from lack of citizenship and lack of representation, which is if you don't control the government, that makes the fundamental decisions about your lives. It's true that in area A and area B, which constitute 40% of the West Bank, Palestinians run the civil aspects of government. But still, Israel is the only state that is in control of that territory. And in 60% of the West Bank, 60% of the West Bank, area C is under direct Israeli control. 
So the, uh, the ability of Palestinians to do things like get their fair share of the, di of the distribution of water, or um, to stop the encroachment of settlements that, that take away their land, or to build their own towns and villages, is, is, is fun the fundamental reason they can't do that is because they have really no influence over the government that is making mostly those fundamental decisions. And that's the fundamental problem, that fundamental inequity, which has now been around for 45 years. So I think it's, it's great that you had that experience. And I think if more American Jews did have that experience, they would see that this is, um, that, that um, we have moral obligations to the people who are living under occupation. And we also have a moral obligation to the state of Israel, that the state of Israel should not be corrupting itself morally in the way that an occupation does. That occupation is wrong both for the Palestinians who have to live under it, and it's also wrong to send Israeli 18 and 19 year olds to go and be agents of an occupation when it's not the vision of the Jewish state that the founders of the state had. My name is Daniel Lipman. I was just wondering, um, what, uh, like, what's the scale of the threat from a nuclear launch to, to Israel? And there's been a lot of like war talk for the last yeah. like, two months yeah. in Israel. Yeah. How do you think they should respond, or how do you think they will respond? They, like, um, thanks. So the, um, the question was about was about Iran. Um, look, I, I think that. Iran getting a nuclear weapon is a very, very bad and dangerous thing. Um, it's a bad and dangerous thing because I think it shifts the regional power balance in the Middle East in Iran's direction. I think it creates the possibility that especially some of the countries in the Gulf essentially start to kowtow to Iran, uh, which I think would be bad for the United States and bad for the world. It also creates the possibility of a regional arms race that would be very dangerous, given the fact that uh, uh, I don't think we want a world in which Saudi Arabia, for instance, gets a nuclear weapon. It's bad enough that we already have a world in which Pakistan, which has the potential of, of kind of uh, jihadist infiltration, has a nuclear weapon. I don't think we want the Saudis where, goodness knows, Osama bin Laden would probably get a significant percentage of the vote in a free election. I don't think we want uh, the Saudis to follow Iran's lead. But that is different than saying that Iran represents an existential threat to the survival of the state of Israel, which is what Benjamin Netanyahu says. And I think it's very important to remember that when Benjamin Netanyahu talks about that, uh, talks in that language, it is not a view that is shared by everyone in the Israeli security establishment. In fact, um, there have been a number of top Israeli leaders who have said in recent years that they, in fact, do not believe that Iran represents an existential threat to the state of Israel. Tamir Pardo, who's the current head of Mossad, Israel's external security agency, said, quote, the term existential threat is used you too freely. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, head, the current head of the IDF is on record as saying the Iranian leadership is composed of very rational people. Okay. I would add, very evil people but not people who have a record. Remember, the Islamic Revolution has been going on, has been there since 1979. These guys have been in power for a very long time. They've been very, very bad guys for a very long time, but they do not have a record of doing things that would be suicidal. If they, had a, if they wanted to be suicidal in order to kill as many Jews as possible, they would have given their ally Hezbollah chemical or biological weapons long ago. In fact, Israel in the early 1980s, right after the Islamic Revolution, was on very good terms with the government of Iran. In fact, Israel was one of the few countries that during the Iran-Iraq war was actually on Iran's side. So I want to be clear, Iran getting a new weapon would be a very, very bad and dangerous thing. And I, I support any effort, any measure of sanctions, uh, diplomacy, and even covert action that has some reasonable prospect of stopping it. I'm not a pacifist, um, uh, and, I, and even though sanctions can uh, impose a cost on the Iranian people. I'm not against them if they are part of a strategy of diplomacy that gives us a chance of stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. The problem with military action is that virtually everybody in the Israeli defense and security establishment believes that, Iran, that Israeli military action would be relatively ineffective 
given how far away Iran is, how deep underground the sites are, and Israel's capacity, and that the consequences would be truly frightening in terms of the regional war that it would produce. And I think one of the fascinating things we've seen in Israel over the past year or so has been a really uh, remarkable struggle inside the Israeli government between Netanyahu and perhaps Ehud Barak on one side, and virtually everyone in Mo at high levels in Mossad, Shin Bet, and the Israeli Defense Forces on the other over this question. And I have to say, it makes me proud of Israel because the Israeli security officials and intelligence officials are doing exactly what our military leader and intelligence leadership did not do in the run-up to the Iraq War. They're really raising hell about this because they think it's bad for their country. And I, I just hope that they'll ultimately succeed and that we in the United States will help them succeed. Okay, Peter, there's a long line, okay. so I need your questions to be a little more condensed. Okay. Next. You want to lift that so you don't have to bend down? Okay. Uh, you speak about the uh, crisis in Israel due to the occupation and the crisis in American Zionism due to our inadequate Jewish education. But American Jews and American Jewish education is not responsible for the occupation. The people responsible for that is the Israeli government and Israeli people, because there's a crisis in Israeli Zionism as well as American Zionism. But I would like to know what do you think American Jews can do to help increase the sense of social justice and concern for Jewish values among the Israelis? For example, it would be wonderful, as you say, if we could raise a billion dollars for Jewish education in America. 